The most interesting thing going on this week in the Tesla world, as exciting as X Takeover is, Q2 earnings. I just posted my estimate coming up with 46 cents of adjusted earnings per share. Market's at 41. Last quarter, I think I was lower than where Wall Street was. I was a bit surprised at just how high this figure was. So I thought what might be fun to do is to share my model in real time. What I think is most important for this quarter's EPS estimate is the fact that you had the Model Y changeover happening at all four plants in Q1 and you're breaking out of that in Q2. So I did something a little bit different in Q1 when I was doing this. I did a modeled quantity for each of the different units, including the old Model Y. The vast majority of the units they sold in Q1, I believe, were the old Model Y. Only about 100,000 of the new Model Y. That was my estimate. Tesla doesn't share this information. But what we know is that Tesla was deeply discounting these units at the same time you had the all four factories shut down for a significant amount of time, which is going to increase your cost of goods sold. It's going to reduce your gross margins. So when I was looking at the Q2 model, my question was, what's going to happen with the new Model Y now that we're a good quarter in and we've got some pretty regular production? And then, of course, ASPs are higher. So while we're through the launch series of the Model Y, which had the very high price, at least in the U.S., that ended very early on in the quarter. So you don't get that super high price on those vehicles. But you do have a higher ASP, I'm sure, overall than when you were discounting the old Model Ys. So walk through some of that logic here. I tied the total number, the 384,000 deliveries that Tesla released in their production and delivery report. I'm assuming a split where you've only got around 10,300 Cybertrucks and then S and X, 90,000 Model Y, and then the balance of that figure is assumed to be the new Model Y. Coming down here to pricing. You can see my assumptions here for last quarter, we had 34,500 as the ASP for the old Model Y. Now that included a very high degree of the deep discounting that they were doing, five, $8,000 per vehicle in, in some cases. On average, I think that really drove down ASPs. So you got none of that this quarter. I think the new Model Y in the US is gonna come down though, because you're getting off that launch mission. The rest of world Model Y price, mostly China, but a bit in Europe, I just kept that assumption unchanged. I would like to ask a couple of questions. On the Model Y, we don't have the performance edition yet, a little bit of a drag. So that kind of pulls it one way, but the thing pulling it the other direction is those launch edition Model Ys, did they get FSD for free or did they pay for the FSD bundled in? Because if it's paid for bundled in, that means we didn't count all of it in Q1. We won't count all of it until it is complete. The way that I handled that for my modeling purposes, that model was a hair under $60,000. So I assumed 52,000 for the actual core vehicle price. And I counted mm. for FSD separately, but $8,000 FSD price is stripped out of this. As I'm backing out the comparison, it's like a base model or like a, an average model, excluding FSD to the same kind of thing. And then even to this $47,500, we assume a certain attach rate for FSD that I'll account for later on the model. Sure. And I don't know how much this would be referral dollars that were granted in Q1, but not paid out until Q2. Some people buying whole cars with it, some not mm -hmm. the whole purchase price, getting $15,000 discounts on new cars, but also using it on charging, which is good margin money anyway. But I think that would be just a sliver of a sliver. Yeah. And I think that gets baked into cost of goods sold at the time that the vehicle is, is sold and then it becomes deferred revenue. So if you've got all those credits in your account and then Let's say you start doing charging in Q2. I actually just bought a charger for my in-laws, one of those home chargers with some of my credits. So I believe they accounted for the cost of goods sold of the referral bonus at the time. My referee <laughs> bought the car. They account for that cost at the time of sale. And then as you redeem the credits, they take that deferred revenue off the balance sheet. Great. The last piece is cost of goods sold, which where did I... You can have that. Okay, here we go. Sorry, I'm losing my mind here. Cost of goods sold. The thing to, to kind of look at here is change quarter over quarter. So with the, the refresh in the model S, S and X, I assume the cost of goods sold just increased a little bit. That might not even be true given how small of a portion of the quarter that was, but it's really a de minimis impact anyways. Obviously we have no cost of goods sold for the old Model Y since it's not being produced anymore. Yay, that's good to see. And then for the new Model Y, I did assume this a $5,000 increase, or sorry, decrease in the US Model Y. The reason for that is that with the old version, you basically got every single option completely for free. So if you wanted the premium paint and the nice chairs, you had that benefit. More importantly, on top of trim selection, do you have the plants being utilized more significantly? Fremont and especially Giga Texas with those lines being more fully utilized rather than being down for weeks. 
that's going to bring, you know, your semi fixed portion of the overall cost spend down a little bit, putting those two factors together. I'm estimating a $5,000 increase in cost of goods sold for the new model Y in the U S um, a decrease. Yeah. Did I say increase? You did. The, the, Bradford and I have a thing where every single week when we do this live stream, I'll get at least one word wrong where they say the exact opposite thing of what I mean. So. <laughs> I'm going to agree with your assumptions on that. I think 41 is probably right for the beginning of a new model. And mm -hmm. I think getting to 36 now and perhaps 35, 34 later is very possible as they increase utilization. I think you're on the money there. Okay. So I'm sure these specific numbers will be wrong. And the good thing is we'll never know because they don't break it out in this level of detail. But what I try to do each quarter is go back and actually tie out my results so that the numbers in my model will actually match what Tesla reported. So then as I go and forecast Q2, for example, all the Q2 numbers are with figures or assumptions that are made to tie to the actual results of Q1 that Tesla released. The last assumption, I'm just assuming a $1,000 improvement in rest of world Model Y. That might be slightly on the low side, but it did seem that the Shanghai factory got up to speed a lot more quickly than the US and you're going to have lower trim levels there anyway. I'm not sure that these numbers are all right, but I think directionally they, they seem about right to me. When I put all this together, you can sum the product of your quantity and your price and then sum the product of your quantity and your cost of goods sold. And you essentially get revenue line items and then cost of goods sold line items. So when I was doing this, I was showing what I call the core manufacturing margin. And this is not something that Tesla discloses. It's a metric I made up, but I've been using it for years to great effect. Essentially what I'm doing is taking automotive gross margin and subtracting out credits, ZEV credits, which almost everybody does. But then I'm also uh, subtracting out my estimate of their FSD revenue, which I think most people don't actually estimate, but that's something that I back out so that I actually have an insight into what's going on at the plant level and then layering in my FSD assumption separately from that. So when I did that, I was pretty shocked to see the core manufacturing margin increase from 8.1% in Q1, which was abnormally low. I think before that it was about 10%. It jumped all the way to 15% in Q2. I was expecting something like 10, 11%. So for it to almost double was pretty surprising to me. But as I went back over the numbers, all the assumptions seemed reasonable. So even though the conclusion surprised me a little bit, I think it's actually reasonable. That's, I would double check my math on a jump like that too. Interesting. I think the biggest thing, when you come back to the old Model Y, you've got the old Model Y at a $34,000 price tag and essentially $34,000 cost of goods sold, but very slim margin. And you had 165,000 of those units. So all those zero margin vehicles are going away and being replaced with these now much higher margin new Model Ys, which have a higher ASP and a, honestly, like a comparable cost of goods sold to the old version. It yes. is the most popular model. It might be beat by RAV4 this year because RAV4 was not taken offline for retooling, but we'll see. Yeah, what's interesting about this is with this assumption, it's showing a 24% manufacturing gross margin on the US made Model Y, which is crazy. That's a big part of the assumption is that that went from a like almost zero margin product to a 24% gross margin product before even selling FSD. That seems high, but it also seems right for a premium vehicle at a great price point with pretty reasonable cost of goods sold. So maybe I'm off a little bit on that. If this cost of goods sold was, I don't know, 38,000, for example, then our margin would increase to only 13.8% versus 15. But overall, I'm pretty comfortable with it. To me, it, it was a huge impact to these factories to be down for so long in Q1. I think the, the jump is justified. My opinion, but people can feel free to disagree. I won't walk through the rest of the model, but I'll point out a few highlights. There's a lot for people to take in. We have the 384,000 deliveries multiplying by the price. I've got my FSD assumptions here. I'm assuming a decrease in FSD take rate because uh, you had the kind of mandated attach rate on all those new US made launch series model wise. So I think that's going to come down. And then on top of that, you had FSD launching in China in Q1. I think there was a bit of excitement in some people wanting to test it out there. For that reason, I took the overall global take rate down to 7%. I've got a couple other items down here, like FSD subscriptions, a few other things that kind of go into the overall pie. But then coming down here, let's jump to the bottom line. I've got this 15% margin that we spoke about before. And when you flow that through and add the credits and the FSD revenue, I get the automotive gross margin at 19.3%. So where we saw core manufacturing margin going from eight to 15, what's actually reported by Tesla, this is a much more modest increase. And to me, it feels about right. 
And I would say that I'd be very curious to know when the ZEV credits from manufacturers actually stops. Did they stop cutting checks on the date that it was made clear that the 0% penalty on missing targets was going to come through? Was there money that came in before that? How's that going to work, I wonder? Yeah, it's a good question. This is one thing I've tried many times over the years to get a little bit more clarity on exactly what are the accounting rules for these credits. It seems pretty opaque where they've got a lot of leeway in terms of when they recognize them and when the credits are transferred versus when the payments actually come across. So it's one of those things that has consistently been extremely difficult to model. What I usually try to do is grab up a number that's reasonably in line with historical levels. Um, one thing I'd like to point out on transparency is that companies are not typically very transparent, some more than others, but the analysts are opaque. They a brick wall. They'll give you the bottom number and that's it. You don't know how much of it's dartboard math. You don't get to look at it and see which assumptions are wrong. And that's one thing yeah. I love about the Tesla community and people like you is that when it comes to production, I generally show my numbers. When it comes to earnings, you're actually showing the math. James Stevenson does a great job too. You can decide where we're crazy and where you disagree and make an informed assumption based on that. Yeah, honestly, I love James putting 69 slide presentations or X threads with detailed assumptions. To James's great credit, like if his numbers are saying something wildly different from consensus, either on the bullish side or on the bearish side, he'll just go with it. And I think that's the right approach. I try to do that as well. That 15% figure seemed a little too high to me, but I wasn't going to just reduce the numbers because it was a surprise to me. And I think a lot of analysts have pressure to say, okay, consensus is at 41 cents. I can't be more than 20% or 30% different from that number because then I'm going to look like an idiot if I'm wrong. But I think the right approach for modeling is to lay out all these assumptions to the best of your ability and, and stick with them, even if the conclusion is somewhat surprising. And we've seen that. I've seen it more... Not as much in the last two or three years, but certainly before that, where all these analysts would publish it and then migrate towards the median. Nobody wants to stick their neck out. Yep. I think that's very true. On energy, I'm assuming the gross margins come back a little bit. I'm assuming in the long term, energy gross margins will revert to the 25% level that they've spoken about in the past. Used vehicle prices are still pretty depressed, which impacts the services margin. So there's a lot that gets in there, but I'm not assuming any significant changes there. I did assume a pretty significant uptick in R&D this quarter, which is one of my more contrarian assumptions, but it seems like they are very rapidly expanding the FSD program. We're hiring a lot of specific people in Austin and some other locations now. I would assume those would go into the R&D bucket, but I think with everything that's going on with Optimus and FSD and a RoboTaxi, it just seems likely that we're going to have a bit of an increase in spend there relative to the levels that we've seen historically. So assuming about 150 million increase quarter over quarter, which gets to operating income of 927 million. The big change here is I'm assuming a $280 million benefit because Bitcoin has rallied. So as of the end of September, uh, there was a rally. I did some napkin math around that. This is one that's hard to gauge because I've done napkin math around this before and still not quite getting close to the numbers that Tesla actually reports, but it stands to reason, I think that there will be some benefit reported this quarter on that front. So that's a, a bit of a boost, although I think it's a not really core, not really meaningful boost to the company's profitability. But putting that all together, it's 32 cents of gap earnings per share and 46 cents of non-gap. So that is my assumption for tomorrow. Love it. Yeah, I would love to argue with you, but I don't do these numbers. So I will just say thank you for putting them together and sharing them.